Welcome to the episode 36 of Take It Easy 3 6. Uh, so today we've got an interview with Kate. Uh, Kate's going to talk about safety at the uh, Chargers, basically. Um, you know, it's it's one of those subjects, apart from the accessibility, that's uh, not been talked about quite openly as of yet. And uh, as more and more people adapt EVs in their lives, we will have to kind of consider the Charger safety and accessibility as a sort of bundle. And... Uh, Kate does a you know, Kate decided to kind of get into it and uh, following her own private experiences, um, you know, do something about it, which is you know what you want in life. Uh, if you see a problem, do something about it. Be the change you want uh, to be, or to make in the world. Something like that. You get you get what I mean. Anyway, before I get on with today's show, um, I had a very fun conversation with Kate, but the uh, this is the first time I kind of recorded uh, something this way and we had some technical issues uh so initially you'll see me a bit blurry on the screen don't worry about it it's just the uh, the camera basically got out of focus and um that you're, you're recording video on zoom or whatever you know you don't know whether it's the just the low resolution whilst you're recording it or it's a low resolution oh sorry it's out of focus in my case it turned out to be the latter latter so um just bear with me, it will change in about 10 minutes into the episode. Um, if you're hearing this as an audio, by the way, and you're confused, uh, this whole video is going to be available as a YouTube uh, uh, video. That's the word. <laughs> um, anyway, I uh, so yeah, I, I, I do want to record more of these as a video uh, in the future. And, you know, I think that's the best way to deliver these things. Because... Um, uh, Apart from the length of the episodes, some people would like them to be shorter. Um, the second sort of criticism that I always get or feedback is the, uh, why don't you make them as a video? It's not always possible. I do like to record on site. And audio is also just easier to uh, uh, to edit, um, especially if I, you know, if I uh, waffle on about something too much as a, as a question. I can re-record the question afterwards in an audio format. I can't do that when I'm recording live with a with the guests so um in this episode you know some of my questions are kind of lengthy but bear with me you know um hopefully you like this format uh, it's nice to see moving heads in the video before i move on i would like to thank my patrons bogart matthew thompson andrew till and chris m you guys are wonderful um i you know i couldn't do this without you i'll let you in a secret i'm seeking f uh, some sort of form of sponsorship that will fit the channel or fit the the, the, the podcast but in the meantime uh, you know patreon.com slash takeedv if you want to chip in a little bit because every little helps I've just had to pay hundred and something pounds for the um, uh, to keep the, the thing running for another year so you know that's one of the costs that these guys uh, help cover at least in a little bit uh, you know, travel, all the equipment that I'm using here, um, you know, that's all coming out of my own pocket. I would like this thing to grow, basically, and would get, like to get more money to, do, be able to, to be able to do more things. So I've got really great guests lined up. Um, and, you know, just to be able to do it f uh, uh, more often, I think, is, is, is a dream of mine. Uh, at the moment, it's just a hobby. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to go pro anytime soon, but at least a bit of... Uh, a bit of support from the uh, from folks listening would be great. Um, the other thing I have to say is, if you're not subscribed, if you're on YouTube, just you know subscribe the thing and do the bell thing and whatever. Um, leave the comment down below. Don't, don't say anything mean. You know, we're friends here. Just be nice. Share this episode with anyone you know. If anybody ha has concerns about safety or accessibility, let them know about this podcast. Uh, if you have any questions and or you have suggestions uh take it ev at gmail.com is the email you can use uh i welcome all feedback uh if you have any questions that you would like me to talk about and in any case i would like to thank kate for her time and uh enjoy the uh, the show so uh, we're here today to talk about <laughs> safety right and uh it's safety and accessibility. I think uh, like it's like the subjects that have recently been um, 
talking on the podcast about and the um and i've had uh john john mcbeardy no uh beardy mcbeardy face he uh, he likes to call himself publicly on twitter um and he's obviously a person who's uh, living with a disability so yeah. he's got something to say about that but we haven't had anybody talking about safety so you know we, we're all ears like tell us what you guys are all about or what you are all about um uh actually can we actually start because you know our our connection or your connection to this podcast is is unusual um so can you just like tell me from your perspective what it looks mm. like what you can you say um because i think that's a good a good story and not everyone has heard it yet yeah of course so i first came across the podcast on my long drive from portsmouth to grimsby Uh, on my way to my job interview with Jordan Brompton, who is, of course, the very lovable chief marketing officer of and co-founder of My Energy. And I was looking for a podcast that she'd been on because it was a long drive. And I thought, at least if I can listen to some things that she's done, it will help prepare me better for my job interview. And one of those podcasts was the Take It Easy podcast, where you'd had a conversation with Jordan. And I just remember... It was so informative and all of the questions that you'd asked her, you know, it was right at the beginning yeah. of one of the fir- the first lockdown and it was very much around, you know, what was she doing with the business? How was it reacting to the pandemic? And she was like, well, actually, it's this just gotten more busy, um, which was really encouraging to hear as I was, you know, on my way to a job interview in like in terms of ongoing job security. And uh, and what really cracked me up was that you uh, were very uh, forthcoming in asking for your own Zappy cover. Oh, yes. Which, yeah. as it turns out, she did deliver on, which is just fantastic. So you're the only person in the UK with a bright red Zappy cover, Greg. I am, yes. Uh, if I... Don't forget, I'll flash a picture here somewhere. Uh, the uh, it is on the on the Twitter. If you go to the uh, at Take It Easy, if you if you want to scroll through like thousands and th- thousands of vid- of pictures that I post, um, you'll see it. Um, but yes, I I I I'll, you know I'll let you uh, let, let let you on a secret. I usually um, have like four or five points that I'm going to talk about, and the rest of it is just off the cuff. So depending on. It, it, it must have been something she said or you know we just been, were talking about things and the subject kind of popped in my head and I thought you know um, I looked at all the covers and it's just like white and gray I like red color so can I have a red one I just I just thought I'll just ask you know <laughs> and 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 yeah I I, I remember I um, I I got the uh, I got the zappy it came in a box and I, I emailed her because she was like, yeah, yeah, definitely, you're definitely going to get it. Like, I didn't, you know, I didn't push for it. And then she said, don't worry, it's coming as a separate thing. And a couple of days later, it just came nicely packed and, and all that. And it, it was apparently uh, done by a professional, uh, like a car body repair shop uh, painter. So it's not just, you know, it's not just yeah. like red, red, but it's a white <laughs> cover. That well, they had was, it like professionally dipped, I think. Um, so I, it was... I don't know, but it looks awesome. Like it, and uh, year on, it's still you know as good as it was. So I'm I'm amazed, and thank you, Jordan, because <laughs> it's you know, <laughs> it was a, it was a it was a I often just you know come up with questions or whatever, so just in a, uh, in the moment, and uh, mm. it was one of those things I just thought I'll ask. And, um, That's pretty awesome. I think you are the envy of a lot of my energy fans all over the world. And uh, yeah, as we know now, as a result of listening to the podcast, I was fully informed and I was able to talk to her about the podcast and having just heard it. And uh, I got the job, um, which has in some weird roundabout way landed me here speaking to you two years later. (laughs) So you just left the job. I've yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so we've, we've we've recently well we've recently left my energy so that I can fully focus on charge safe which is really exciting and it was it was really difficult because it was probably the first time in my whole career that I've had to leave a job that I genuinely really loved for a company that I just really admire and I'm very inspired by so but I know that I'm going on to do things for the greater good so it's kind of like it's it's a bittersweet feeling in a way um 
but you know, I was literally speaking to Jordan this morning. We're still in cahoots. So uh, yeah, who knows what will happen in future? I think that's the best way to leave the job is in, on good terms, you know, mm. and to do something amazing. So it's, uh, I'm sure she's envious. She's like, I don't know. I don't want to put, put uh, words in her mouth. But she's probably thinking, I, 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 I wish we, we could have done this, but they're not in the, in, you know, they're in a different business, so and I'm sure. Oh, they're in a busy. totally different league now as well. Yeah. You know, they're in Australia and Germany, and they're looking at the US really seriously. So, they've Jordan's got big, big things on her plate at the moment. Yeah. So, you know, wish yeah. them all the best, and uh, yeah, but just it is really just so lovely how that has kind of landed me here having a chat with you about about a completely different subject. Um, that has really been born as a result of having the company electric vehicle. I am personally a huge fan of your solar hat. Oh, thank so, you. you know, for, for those who are watching or listening, um, having listened to Greg's lovely podcast with Jordan, I then got to physically meet Greg last year at the fully charged live show <laughs> with his wonderful hat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just brilliant it's got a fan in it as well hasn't it to keep to keep your head cool yeah it does actually i could i, could, I just had brilliant. my dinner so i could use this it needs to go into mass production greg it needs to happen there, there is a patent for it somebody's holding a, a patent and um and um i think it's it's until 2025 or something Excuse mm. me. Um, so uh, it's not going to be until the patent is out that there's probably going to be a mass flood of Chinese produced hats like that. I just always wanted to have one. And it was kind of my own self thought, you know, it's one of those things that um, I'm sure thousands of people have thought about this, but I decided just to act on my own thinking. It, it's very cool. <laughs> Don't downplay it. It's very cool. <laughs> I mean, it's a very simple idea. It's just a bunch of solar panels and, and fans. Nothing to it, really. Yeah. Anyway, but we're here to talk about you because I can. Yeah, I've got a podcast. I can talk about myself all the time. <laughs> um, so the uh, the uh, charge safe. You were just saying that you left my energy to do your own thing. So can you tell us about your own thing? Yes. So um, I think you know the journey kind of started when I got the position with my energy. Um, being the events manager would involve me driving up and down the country and and going to visit. Uh, clients and potential new business partnerships. So um, Jordan felt it was only right that I should ditch my diesel and adopt an electric vehicle. So uh, that's kind of where the charge safe journey started really in that every time I had to drive long distance, anything more than 200 miles would mean a stop and charge at some point along the journey. And going from Portsmouth to Grimsby, you know, that's an easy 300 miles. So every time I went up to the office, I would have to stop and charge somewhere. So I very quickly became quite au fait with the public charge network, um, using rapids, making the, the best use of Twitter as well. I have to say, you know, my, my best source of information is honestly Twitter and the community. They're just amazing. I think I've quite publicly said on a few occasions on Twitter I love you guys like the community is just amazing um just a really wholesome crowd of people who are more than prepared to give you advice and tell you about you know if there's a specific issue with a charger you're going to find someone on Twitter who's probably tried to use it in the last two days which is just really lovely so my first um journey in an EV I turned to Twitter and that was uh I stopped at Watford Gap and I was using the old Ecotricity okay. um, electric highway before it was bought out from GridServe uh, to the point where I had to sit and ugly cry at the charger because I wasn't sure how to really use it. And nobody nobody really prepares you for that first long journey in an EV. And Twitter came, came forward and, and saved the day. So pretty much what's happened since is there have been quite a few late night drives when I've been on my way home from the office. Um, it, to the best of my ability, you know, the sat nav tells you it's going to take five hours. It usually takes me seven or eight. For some reason, it takes longer to drive north to south than it does south to north. I do not understand it, but it happens. So it would always be dark and late by the time I would hit my need for, for a charge. And 
with experience, you start to learn that you need to have an extra 30 or 50 miles on whatever your destination is, just in case something goes wrong. So, you know, you pick these things up and I always try to get a little bit of extra juice on there just in case something something happens. And there was one particular night where I was driving back from Grimsby. Um, we'd literally just done the road to cop with the EVA. Everybody had come up to my energy head office in Grimsby. It was really lovely. And then I was driving home and I was swearing and I was shaking and I was like, I cannot believe I've got myself into this position. Um, and what had actually happened was I had done my midway uh, charge and that was absolutely fine. I had an extra 30 miles on my journey. But then what happened was I was redirected around the Farnham um, belt where they closed off a massive section of the A3. So uh, I thought, OK, I'm losing my emergency mileage now. I should probably stop and charge again. So at this point, it's gone 11 at night. I found a charger using a, a mapping application. Uh, went to it and it was it it wasn't working, but it was also in a very, very abandoned car park is the best term that I've got for it it had some lighting but there was nobody there bar one vehicle which was packed full of teenagers who weren't exactly the most welcoming uh charge point companions yeah. so that was that one it was a write-off it wasn't working so I found a second charger which was in a supermarket car park and I thought a supermarket car park that should feel a bit safer so I drove there and the superstore I clearly, you know, very energy savvy and had all their lights switched off because nobody's using this car park. Yeah, so I drove into the superstore car park and you assume it's going to be lovely and light, but it's not. They're energy savvy. They've got all their lights switched off. It's very dark. There's nobody there. It's set back from the road and the charge point itself was at the very back end in a corner tucked under a tree and you could just see the tiny little LED screen lit up. And to my horror... To the right of it was actually a very dark alleyway, which was coming from God knows where. I have got no idea where the alleyway led. And I thought, right, great, this, this is welcoming. So I got out of the car, not really even wanting to get out of the car, because when you get out of the car, what people who, who don't use public charge infrastructure or even drive an EV just yet may not realise is when you get out of the car, you have to leave the car unlocked in order to open your charge um, door on your car it has you usually to, be have to turn it off as well so yeah so no quick escape <laughs> and you've got your keys in your hand so that you can you know make sure that the, everything's working properly you've likely got either your mobile or your debit or credit card in your hand or both um depending on whether you're going to use an app or, or pay as you go uh so there i am car keys debit card mobile phone all in hand and i'm staring at a tiny little screen and my back is on my unlocked car in the middle of a dark car park with who knows and yeah. and suddenly I just felt very vulnerable the I plugged the charger into the car jumped back in the car locked everything and just sat there and waited for it to to communicate with the car and it comes up and it says you know charger initiated um but it, it wasn't working so I thought right okay I'm gonna have to call them so I called the charge point operator and by this time it's probably about quarter to 12 um and I spoke to a lady and I said look the charger doesn't seem to be working is there anything that you can do and she said oh yeah like let me see if I can remotely start it and at this point, I think she didn't even want to charge me. She just wanted to make sure not charge. Sorry, she didn't want me to pay for the transaction yeah. okay. to charge um, because she just wanted to initiate the charge so that I could get home safely. I started to panic. I was becoming a bit hysterical. I was shaking. I was crying. I was I was so embarrassed. Um, and And in the end, I said to her, look, this isn't working. I want to go. I don't want to be here. I need to go and find another charger. I'm very sorry to waste your time. I need to leave. And I actually called back the following day to apologize and to say, can you please pass a message on to the lady? Because all their calls would be recorded. They must have a log of it somewhere. You know, can you please just pass a message on to the lady to let her know that I got home okay? Because... I felt so responsible that I probably left her in a position where she had gone home worried yeah. about this young woman who'd been crying on the phone, <laughs> you know, and, and that's not a pleasant situation to be in. Yeah. So that was charger number two on to charger number three. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, this one, so the three very different charge point operators as well, by the way. The last one was uh, one of the big bad oil and gas uh, baddies. And unlike the beautifully canopied, well-lit petrol forecourt, the charger was around the back behind a fence in the dark um and and shockingly actually there wasn't anybody working at the petrol station that night they just shut their doors uh, so it mustn't have been a very busy petrol station for them to stop that service so stopped uh tried plugging in the car and it was an app that i had to log into which wasn't working so i thought oh god like i really don't know what to do i've got 24 miles left on my car and the next best charger was at the Winchester Services, which was 22 miles away. And, but I knew if I got there, it would work because it was a new grid serve unit. So I thought there's absolutely no way that that's, that's going to fail me because I trust that network. It's reliable. It has not failed me yet. So I thought, okay, I could probably do this if I drive extremely conservatively, which is what I did. So I, drove on the hard shoulder 15 miles per hour, switched off the heating, switched off the music, put the hazards on and took a very slow drive on that hard shoulder, physically shaking and terrified that I was going to run out of charge and end up being stuck on the side of a motorway with a car that wasn't going to work um, in the middle of the night. And I didn't even know if the power going would mean that my hazards wouldn't work. So it was very, very uncomfortable. It took me an hour and a half to do that, that 20 four mile trip um in the meantime my partner had actually called me and he said well you're not home yet like is everything okay and I said oh you know I didn't want to bother you (laughs) because it's so late at night I didn't want to tell you that I'm in a bit of trouble and he stayed with me on the phone and so to the point where I actually reached the services he was able to tell me exactly where in the car park I would find the charger because as soon as you get into the services, again, it's not immediately obvious where the charger is. Yeah, only a couple of them in the country have actual, uh, you know, thingies telling you where it is. Yeah, it's... yeah, exactly. And I just thought, what a silly predicament for a 32-year-old woman to be in. I should know better than this. And then I was so angry about it. I literally, I arrived at the charger on zero, zero charge. Wow. So I was very lucky to get there when I did but after it was just this thought that kept churning and I thought this isn't the first time I've brought up safety on Twitter we've seen Maddie Moat talk about it we've seen is it Ginny Buckley has talked about it Jill Nowell's talked about it Jordan's talked about it all of these you know huge influential women in EV have spoken up very boldly about how unsafe they have felt at points in a, a public charger and I thought, well, nobody's actually done anything yet. So, so what is it that I can do? And my partner, James, is actually a software developer. So, you know, being the nerd that he is, he wants to find a solution to the problem. So we sat down and we started talking about it. And at this moment in time, it was really just a, a playful idea, a, like a dream, like, you know, what can we do to make this safer? And then I had to drive to COP in Glasgow for COP26. And when I got to Glasgow, I um, started talking to Graham Cooper about it over some networking lunch that we were at. And he said, Kate, that's a really, really good idea. Um, You should probably also include accessibility as well as safety, because accessibility is also a huge issue. So I started to do some research. He introduced me to Edmund King at the AA, who just loved the idea, um, which was you know, really encouraging for me. And I just thought, okay, I I need to take this seriously. This could actually like create a positive change for EV drivers everywhere. And as we see mass adoption kicking in, we've got more EV drivers on the road. We've got more chargers being installed by the day. You know, if every network does not have a standard that they need to meet, that's across every network. They are just making, making it up as they go along. Yeah. So here we are, Charge Safe. I went out onto Twitter again, the lovely Twitter fam, and I actually said, guys, what would make you feel um, safer when using a public charger? And from all of the answers that we got from those responses, we kind of worked backwards to make them into the set of standards that we would be looking for when 
using a public charger. So for everybody that said lighting, you know, that went up in the ranks as something that's extremely important. Yeah. For everybody that said security cameras, SIA, uh, SIA licensed staff, some form of panic button would be great. Um, not being buried in the bushes, you know, that all of these really simple things that we want as EV drivers that we shouldn't really have to fight for just came up and and now we have a 50 point inspection plan based okay. on the responses that we've kind of fleshed out to include accessibility um and I'm more than happy to go into more detail on that in a moment okay. um but it's it's just been so wonderful and everybody in the community has said you know this is exactly what we need um and I feel like you know okay I am the best person to to be the face of of safety for for women and men and you know, accessibility needs across the UK, because I will fight tooth and nail to ensure that everybody gets the charging experience that they deserve. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but the, uh, I'm, and I'm, you know, a middle-aged white, white bloke. So um, I, you know, not that I'm a fighter, but the, um, I felt unsafe many times at the, at the charger, but it's, I can only imagine if you're, uh, if you're somebody who, you know, is either in the category of people who are either disabled or, or just you know, um, feel weaker basically um, for mm. whatever reason, then you must feel ten times more vulnerable. And I have no idea how that feels. So uh, you know, uh, I've yeah. had I've had uh, I've had to come out and and scare people away because they were uh, being racist, such and such, uh, to somebody who wanted to charge and blocking the charger. I had to stand up to a guy who was basically. Uh, blocking a charger in his PHEV not plugged in uh, to another guy who was, you know, uh, uh, not white, basically. That's uh, horrendous. Blocking a charger as well, and you know, all sorts of things. And I've been—I mean, I've—I've I've traveled. I've done probably hundred thousand miles now in EVs, or or ninety thousand miles, or something. And I've yeah. traveled up and down. And I'm a—I'm a, I'm a you know, adventurous bloke. Uh, so I'm—I'm—I've done. I—I <laughs> I drove my Leaf into. Um, into a sandy beach because I thought, you know, it's fine in Wales and people who live in Wales probably know where it is because um, everybody seems to be doing it there uh, because I thought it's it's a car park and, you know, there is no visible border. And then I had to beg <laughs> in the middle of the night, basically, like pitch black, I had to beg like for strangers to call somebody for help because obviously there's no signal there. And, you oh know, my God. All sorts of things. So I, I, I can understand and I've been to plenty of public uh, chargers that are just unlit or in the middle of nowhere or under a tree under a bush behind the back of a mm -hmm. building like because just just to roll back the the way the way this the whole the, this is a new thing and i think my other guests have said that already but i'm just going to repeat it just for uh anybody who's watching for the first time or listening for the first time but basically the way this works in the uk and i'm pretty sure it's all around the world is at the moment because evs are not the the main category of car um and but you know they're up it's an upcoming thing uh, uh, when you want to put a, a charger somewhere especially a rapid charger um because that's what i think what we mostly talk about we don't talk about destination chargers as much um is if if if, if somebody gives you a ability to put it in their car park or whatever they will give you a spot and they'll say this is where you're going to put it like that you don't have any room to negotiate um mm -hmm. mainly because of the cost reasons but also nobody wants wants you to um dig out half of the car park just to you know uh, run the cable and never mind putting a canopy over it or light or whatever um so th that's the state of play as of sort of now and you know, it needs to change like we cannot uh, uh do it like this forever i mean i understand why things are the way they are but they need to improve um but also, you know, I, I was speaking to um, Ian at Osprey, Ian Johnston, yeah. really, really lovely guy, very much wants to make sure that Osprey are a very safe and accessible network. And he was telling me about how competitive the landowners are actually over the the charging rights. So, you know, you could go to um, a landowner and say, this is where I would like to put this and I would like to have lighting and security cameras. And actually, they'll turn around and say, well, if it's not good enough for you, we're just going to go to one of your competitors. And, you know, how dare they, for starters? Yeah. Like, this is people's safety that you're playing with. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at 
charge point network operators, but also the landlords. So it, it could be a case of Tesco's versus Morrison's, for example, on how safe the supermarket standards are when it looks at safety to call them out on, on things like that. Yeah. It has very much been a land okay. grab exercise. And yeah. I think that's where we're seeing the problems now. And actually, as the the networks become more competitive in terms of bringing those customers to their networks, because, you know, the, the charges are being installed every day. So what makes your network different? Yeah. Well, actually, you know, I mean, for Ian, he's turned around and said, I want to be the safest network, which is great. And some people will just want to be the fastest network or the biggest network. Um, but what we're saying is every network should be safe and yeah, accessible. No- uh, again, yeah, accessibility is also a big one. I, f- I know that Osprey is working very hard on, on making their charging points way more accessible. Because um, mm. th- that's the other problem is quite often you turn up, you know, the, the, the scene could be very lit. It could be middle of the day. But if you're in a, I'm not going to name a restaurant or quote unquote restaurant, fa- fast food joint, uh, you could have a, a, a charger in there where it's very, you know, very narrow and very busy. Um, mm. It could be a nightmare for anybody who doesn't want to, fight or stand up to somebody who's bullying them uh, to either move because they're ice the 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 um the point or because you know it's it's just not feasible for them to to squeeze in and and open the door um and quite often i i'm there charging and i parked the way i parked because that's the that's the space that was available to me and somebody mm. tr- is trying to squeeze in and i can see that they can't even open the door but i can't move i'm in the middle of charge uh if i had more space if we had all, all space more space around us it would have been you know i wouldn't feel terrible and they would have been able to to carry to carry on with their charge it's just you know um accessibility and kind of having space is is something that hits everybody uh, like you could have kids with you or or even your dog or your your whatever you know you could you could be your yeah whatever like life happens and you know shit happens as they say um and and you mm. need to you need to kind of think about that in your life as well it's not just uh and charge point just... etiquette as well greg this is something <laughs> that we're seeing talked about loads more on twitter now so before it was everybody was talking about safety and i was like don't worry guys i've got a solution <laughs> but it feels like ever since i came out and started talking about charge safe that it's flipped to okay well kate's dealing with that um everybody's rude at chargers and people are kicking people off of chargers. We, we all saw um, Andrew Till's valiant effort to educate us all on, on charge point etiquette. Bless him. You know, th- there was no right or wrong way to have done what happened on, on that, in that situation. And I think for those who don't know, um, there was a car that was plugged in, but it wasn't charging and there was no light indicating that it was charging and, and he was unplugged um, by, by hey, Andrew. Andrew. <laughs> and, and Andrew did document all of this and he's, you know, been very open about it on Twitter and asked everybody for their feedback. And, uh, and there have been some really shocking replies to that from people in America who were like, you know, if you, if you did this in Texas, we have guns and that could have gone horrifically bad and it's like oh my god like how do we deal with these situations if your car is plugged in and it's not charging what do you then do and there are there's an app out there called need to charge um which is something that everybody should probably register to which tells the the user i'd like to use this charger please but where that's not available or if the other the chargee doesn't have it then what do we do? And we just do not have a set of rules to comply with. So we're all just making it up as we go along. And, and yeah, and, and also, know. and also not everybody's going <clears> to, <throat> even if there are rules, you know, who's going to, who, like, we're no longer in the territory where somebody, like most of the people, you know, four or five years ago when I got my EV, uh, uh, knew each other almost and were on the forums. Like it was a seldom, uh, like it, it didn't happen very often that I would uh, run up, up to somebody at a charger that I didn't know from a you know from a forum or or uh, it, I, we just knew each other unless you were mm. in a PHEV uh, of certain kind kind um, but because they didn't seem to care but the um, but most of the pure EV drivers knew each other or knew somebody or they were on the same forum you know um, whereas nowadays you run up to a charger and there's plenty of new people who just bought their car and they, they don't care about, you know, socializing about their EVs. It's just a car to them. Um, and nobody's going to tell them what the etiquette is. Like no, the number of times that somebody was touching the screen whilst I was charging. Uh, and I was like, what are you doing Muppet? Like, you know, I would ha- I had to beep at them or whatever. 
all right, I'll just look, just give a death stare to whoever was uh, with them in the car, just like thinking like, <laughs> this, is your, this is your husband, now. like, seriously? <laughs> Um, yeah. like, uh, you know, uh, some people had uh, other others literally uh, pressing the emergency stop button in front of them, and oh, you're like, God. "Why? What are you doing?" Uh, like, you know, that's <laughs> that's just not that's not even um, that's not even like like a charging etiquette. That's just being a human. Like, just but what? But with the emergency stop button, something I've never understood is why is it that when would we ever need to use it? Because it's not to it's, stop it's, it. It's, yeah, it's it's a health and safety. So the, the DC electricity is very is deadly serious uh, and and it just needs to be there, for, you know, just in case anything happens. Obviously, there's so many safety uh, um, systems in the car and in the charger that nothing should happen. But say a cable was exposed for some reason and something didn't quite trigger, uh, it would be too late to press that button, but you want to press that button just to kind of de... Uh, I mean, the technical term is the uh, de-energize the the circuit, but basically to 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 remove the power from the system. Um, right. It has uh, like uh, I'm not gonna say which network, but there there is a network that kind of haphazardly has added, um, retrofitted, I should say, uh, uh, contactless uh, um, payment system to the chargers, mm -hmm. and uh, and if you use Apple Watch or Apple Pay, sorry, um, to enable the charger. It's not going to tell you anywhere that you can't stop the charger with uh, with your watch or your phone, but you have to use the the emergency button to stop it. As I found out a few times, uh, um, so it it serves you know it serves its use, and then you obviously you could call them, but then you have to wait half an hour uh, on the phone uh, for them to answer, um, which you don't you don't want when you're finished charging. I kind of feel like I know who you're talking about yeah, though. I don't want to. I don't. You know, I've I've got a. I've got a serious uh, uh, security. Uh, I work in the security in IT security industry, so I mm. I've got a serious security concerns with the way they've implemented that system. But they're a big petroleum company. You know, everyone's going to know about it now. Uh, but the uh, they're not going to listen to somebody like me. I mean, people have blocked me on Twitter because I've <laughs> I've, I've complained the, about the their problem, service. So the problem with big uh, big oil and gas companies trying to greenwash their reputations by installing EV chargers is they don't really appear to actually care uh that is, i could that just i could swear i could have sworn so easily there but they just they don't give a f do they 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 really don't care um but they will take 30 quid as a pre-off which by the way it's not a pre-off it's a full-on transaction and then if you don't get it back within 30 days you have to chase them to get your 30 quid back and even after you've done that after the 30 days that they keep palming you off to wait for um then they they'll escalate it and they'll investigate and then a refund will take five to ten days after the investigation and it's like you've taken my money your charger failed you did not refund it straight away as so many of our wonderful independent networks have done. So networks that have not been born from oil and gas yeah. um, who take care of the operations and maintenance of their units. 37 days I waited for 30 quid. Wow. Now, if that happened three or four times, that's over a hundred quid. Somebody, somebody commented on my Twitter, Greg, and I, you know, when you just, You've had a bad day and you're like, <laughs> I'm, I'm done with this. I called him, I called him a dick. <laughs> I called him a bad word on Twitter. I'm going to have to mark this said, explicit now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he, because he said, oh, well, why would an EV driver care about waiting 30 days for 30 quid back? They, they can clearly afford it. And I said, you know what? Not everybody who drives an EV is, is flash uh, with cash. Actually, exactly. it, it could be because they're more savvy that they've saved up money to buy an EV because of the running costs are lower, or they've been lucky enough to get one as a company car, yeah. which was my case, you know, and I don't have 30 pounds to just keep dropping every other day when I'm doing long distance journeys. Yeah, especially it's if you're not... driving every day and you have to charge on the roads like a couple of times a, day, a week, you know, that, that adds yeah. up pretty quickly to, to you know, hundreds of pounds. Um, it does and again this is an unsafe thing that that network is doing um so holding on to funds for any more than an hour after that charge has happened you know there are networks out there that refund the difference very promptly or refund it if the charge fails to initialize um but if you are then late at night on your own having to find another charger or even not late at night and you need to find another charger in order to complete your journey, if you can't do that because of the charging company has held on to your money, it's not safe because you're not going to complete your journey and you're, you're stranded. 
I, I completely agree. I, um, one of the reasons why I use uh, Apple Pay is there's, there's a certain safety standard added by Apple in the whole transaction, um, which means that they're not holding the money for too long, basically, because uh, Apple kind of does that on your behalf. So, you know, I, I don't know if that works with Google, Google Pay uh, for your, or your Google people, but, um, you know, I feel safer charging with Apple Pay, uh, personally. But the... Um, yeah, this is this is like a good old chinwag that uh, every EV driver has every so often. At, at other charges, especially when their cars are charging. <laughs> Let's yeah. go back to the uh, the charge safe. I hope I hope the um, I hope uh, you know safe uh, safety in terms of like the not screwing people over with the money is what one of the things on your on your checklist. Or if it isn't, oh, I, I, would, I would like it to be added, please. It is. It is there now. It wasn't before. But this is a thing. Like this is going to be a continually evolving process. And it really matters to us having feedback from everyday EV drivers. You know, we we could be missing something really, really obvious. But as far as I'm aware, what we've now got is wholly inclusive of the whole process. So we're looking at four separate areas. That's the environment that the charger is in. So that includes, you know, how safe you actually feel. So, you know, are there teenagers hanging around all the time? Is it? under a bridge, um, like the, the one in Glasgow is under a bridge is quite scary. Is it at the back end of a car park or is it in a very well lit forecourt, um, similar to, to the grid serve Braintree um, forecourt? You know, that that is like the dream standard. Um, and even there are really amazing hubs that Osprey are bringing out. So, you know, that we know it can be done. We'd like to see more of it. So environment, big big deal and that's going to penalize the landlords if they fail to make any adjustments on behalf of the charge point network operators as well so we'll be following that very closely then you've got facilities so are there any facilities is there somewhere to go to the loo grab tea coffee um you know how much human activity is there within the locality um and and this is a nice to have not a need to have so for that reason it would be the weight of it would be less important, but it's still there and it's still important. And then the uh, charge points themselves. So with the charge points, that looks at the ease of payment, the pre-off uh, policy, um, like we've just discussed. Um, is the unit actually faulty? So we've seen quite a few times on mapping applications where we have made our way to a charger, turned up, and it's either not even switched on and completely inactive since it was installed, um, which is just bizarre to me because it could be making money, or it's out of service and there's no update as to whether an engineer has been called, scheduled, whatever. It's just completely dead. So that will factor into it. So any companies that are really lax on the operations and maintenance of their networks, they will be told about it we're, we're going to let them know um very very swiftly that it's not okay so you've got environment facilities charge points and that those together will have 30 points around them of the the total score and then the final one is accessibility so we had previously factored that in under charge points but since speaking with motability we've decided it it should be its own um you know entity uh, Motability have been doing some incredible work over the last two years, lobbying the government for some legislation of standards of charge points. And I know um, you mentioned John Biddy McBeardface. I did listen to that as well. That was really great. And uh, I, I got to speak to John just shortly after you recorded with him. And I said to him, you know, uh, th there's there's so many questions that I have for you because I'm not the best person to represent this as an industry you know what things are we missing from this and he's actually agreed to help us uh, form a part of a steering group moving forward to ensure that anybody with a disability is always going to be represented wherever charge safe is concerned so we'll work with motability we'll we'll have john um giving us feedback uh, along the whole journey as well um and their their standards should hopefully become legislation in the next couple of years so that they because they've been lobbying for two years already they're much closer to having something mandated with the government so they're going to share these inspection points with us and we're going to implement that into our inspection which just means that you will know whether or not that site is fit for for use by someone who has an accessibility need and the whole accessibility thing just 
kind of blows my mind anyway. You know, um, John was telling me that he had called ahead, I think, to a charger and they said, you know, just let us know when you get there and we'll come out and plug you in. That's completely undignified. You know, anybody with a disability should, we should be at a point in our lives when if you have a disability, you have the, the systems are in place to enable you to do, you know, every daily day to day task that we can do the same. We should have those systems in place so that somebody can pull up, plug in their car, pay for their charge and get on with their day. Not ask, call and ask someone to come out and help them, you know, unless you love the concierge lifestyle. I mean, <laughs> and- it, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a forecourt, you know, I mean, some some petrol stations, I, I'm not sure about UK, but the uh, I know some uh, forecourts in, in Europe have that mm-hmm. where you, you pull up and somebody will, you know, fill you up or whatever, like, um, uh, which I've turned up in uh, some of them in an electric car and it was hilarious. Because they asked me, what, what do I put the fuel in? I'm like, I, what do I you put don't your have gas, or <laughs> <laughs> You don't have the type of fuel I'm, I'm, I'm using, so sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, and even that feels odd to me when I have to, like somebody else is, is doing things around the car. Like, I want to do it myself. Um, yeah. So I can I can fully understand that. It, it, it does feel a bit, bit odd. Um, I mean, although, you know, on the flip side, having a concierge or, or even just a single person who is there to kind of help would... Uh, I mean, it will cost a lot of money to 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 run such uh, charging station, but the uh, but it would increase safety tremendously. Oh, I totally agree. I think having that there for safety, absolutely. And if somebody has an urgent need, somebody who's technically trained who also has like an SIA le- license um, would be the most ideal person. Somebody who's trained in security can, you know be there to defend someone if if they get into an altercation um but is also technically minded to fix any you know regular fault with a charge point if it is just a case of i thought i saw someone put a pebble underneath a charger cable to get the the connector to fit into his car um when wow. when driving up to scotland recently a pebble and but that was like a really quick fix and if he hadn't have had that the person's phone number who was you know a big part of of charge play scotland he wouldn't have known (laughs) that there was that sort of fix but if you've got somebody permanently placed on site who can support with those things you know how much simpler would it be you know how much safer would you feel so you know there's there's definite dream situations it would be quite costly to the operator to do that but we have come up with a, a slight uh short term hopefully uh remedy to that so i do need to have this conversation with the company that i want to work with but i'm pretty sure that we can make it happen and it would basically be a charge point companion service so on those situations where you're driving home late at night and you're on your own, or you're not on your own, um, you've got kids in the back or whatever, and you pull up to a charge point, and it just feels unsafe. There's a number that you should be able to call, who also run all of the technical support services for a lot of charge point network operators. So they are already trained in the technical elements of the charge points, they will, uh, will understand where you are, where you're located in the car park, and you know, and, and, and where to find you. And they could be a charge point companion in that you stay on the phone for the duration of your charge or however long you want to until you feel a little bit safer. Say you're sat charging for 30 minutes and you're just having a chin wag with someone on the phone who knows where you are. And if a situation escalates, like you could say someone is walking towards my car, this does not feel safe. Um, if the phone if the phone call is disconnected, they can call the emergency services without you having to drop the call and reconnect and redial um, and they will be able to tell them exactly where you are. Um, If it's a case of there being roadside assistance van within the local vicinity, they could probably deploy them just to come and and check in on you and make sure that you're safe. And, you know, if if you get a a well-recognized brand pull up in their van next to you, you feel pretty safe, I think, um, just knowing that somebody's looking out for you. So, that is 100% a service that we're, we're looking to implement with Charge Safe. And I think, you know, short of having a concierge, it's, it's a pretty good alternative. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, there's so many thoughts that I have. Um, but but uh, I, I do hope that places like um, 
like GridServe uh, uh, Hub, they 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 presumably do have somebody on staff twenty four seven there to kind of help with, because you know I can like we're talking about serious situations, but there's a there's a there's a number of times there's mo- actually uh, well there's a number of times that I I pull up to a charger and somebody's just standing there quizzically with a cable in their hand and looking at their car and they have no idea what they're doing, and you know it turns out that they they just got the car and nobody told them what to do. And you have to kind of explain to them. Number of times that I've seen people pull up to a, a, a charger and they open the flap and they look at the chargers, all the cables available, and they look at the flap and they look at the cables available and they're like, you know, they have no idea what's going on uh, because CCS uh, being a, a really like somebody was trying to be clever, uh, quote unquote, with CCS, and you know, added on to the Type One or Type Two uh, plug the uh, the two prongs underneath mm-hmm. but some of those prongs sometimes those prongs are, are covered by a little, little flap in the car and you pull up and if you have no idea and you don't want to touch it because it's you know it's electricity uh, yeah you're just like I, uh, I don't know um number of times that i had to help somebody you know and it wasn't just like you would think it would be a, a blonde or i'm just make, trying to make a joke here but like a, a blonde you know or whatever but the uh no it was quite you are often... blonde aren't you greg no i'm not i'm I, well barely have hair <laughs> i'm, I'm <laughs> My hair is kind of white, so I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm Mine a, too. It's all right. I'm a two, You're all right. I'm an old blonde. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, no, but it, it was in every every single occasion. It was a it was a man that kind of looked a bit beefier and kind of just like you know, oh, I'm a man, mm. man. Um, so you'd think they would know what what's going on, or maybe that's maybe that was the problem. I don't know. Um, I don't. Want, you know. Um, but I had to just <laughs> just flick the thing and say, you plug it in, plug it in there, and it ha- it's happened quite a few times. Um, mm. And it always surprises me. So where I was going with this whole uh, uh, detour is the uh, is the fact that you know sometimes you just want you want have somebody you want to have somebody in there who can just explain things to you. A hundred percent. But at the same time, so that's a really interesting point, and I think there is something there about you know typical ego um, preventing you from asking for help when you need the help, and especially within new EV drivers who you know, are probably experienced in their very first charge, it can be such a daunting process. And I think that's why we all need to remain grounded and just to really be kind to anybody that we come across at, an, a, at a public charger and, and just try to understand if it's their first time having a charge or if they're just having a bad day. Because on the flip side of that, having something mansplained, I don't know why on earth so many guys come out and they're like oh you are you right there miss you know that you can't charge two cars at the same time i'm like i know i know i can't charge this. i'm just looking at the state of charge of your vehicle um or <laughs> just really bizarre things blokes will come over and i'm like i don't i don't need your help thank you i'm perfectly fine i'm kind i'm in the biz <laughs> i you know bugger off <laughs> on your way I do know what I'm actually doing thank you very much but at the same time when you have conversations with other women so I have these these lovely chats with other women they're like oh you know I do do get things mansplained to me quite a lot but I've actually been driving my EV for a really long time and and I feel for them um but actually in my experience it is more often than not men who are sat at the charges trying to look like they know exactly what they're doing who haven't got a clue like I, I bumped into a guy in um an mg5 i think it was uh i think he just picked it up it's his work vehicle and i pulled in to charge at a service station and he sat there uh on 78 percent and i was like are you, are you all right buddy and he was like yeah yeah just waiting to get to 100 percent shouldn't be much longer now i was like nah you're gonna be here for another 45 minutes tell you what when that gets to 80 percent do me a favor <laughs> disconnect and leave <laughs> and he was like what and then I had to explain about the difference between 0 to 80 and 80 to 100 and that actually he would be far better off by moving on and as it turned out he was charging he wanted to charge to 100% because he had perceived range anxiety but he only had to drive 50 miles to get home and I was like you don't even you don't even need 100% of your battery range um, so it really is that piece about you know, really considering how you're going to use the car. Do you need to have 100% battery or could you wait until you get home and maybe find another charger in the morning? Um, do you 
absolutely need to get from that 80 to 100 percent or is there another charger slightly further down the road on your journey um so yeah i i could talk forever about charge point etiquette and yeah, yeah being it's, it's, mansplained it's what... too it's great <laughs> <laughs> i mean i i when I, uh, my previous car uh, nissan leaf you know didn't have a great range so i did have to uh on many occasions I have to charge it to 90 something percent um mm. and in fact that car uh, for whatever reason would sometimes i mean there's a i don't want to get too technical because jill will kill me uh because she wants me to be um much more approachable in in the communications but basically the actual state of the charge of the battery and what the car tells you sometimes is different for various mm. reasons doesn't matter um uh and uh and not always the car will, char- you know, not every car will charge fast till 80% and then drop off like a cliff. Uh, so the Nissan Leaf in its um, grand wisdom, or Nissan in, as a company, the car would sometimes charge super fast up until about 92%. Other times it will it will kind of drop down at 80%. And yeah. you just didn't know. I mean, I could have figured it out eventually, like why uh, or what led to it. But sometimes I would just sit at the charger, you know, and... Uh, and, uh, that's a really dramatic drop though i know do you think that's because the the nissan leaf was one of the the ogs it was one of the first on the market wasn't it so yeah i mean i well my suspicion is that because nissan leaf didn't have or doesn't have uh, active uh, battery cooling it depended on the on the uh on the basically on the temperature of the battery pack right. that was my observation i can't remember i mean i haven't driven that car in in well over a year now so i can't do you remember miss the details. it I mean, it's a nice quirky car, but, um, you know, the range is not great. I mean, it wasn't on mine. And um, but where I was going with this is the, um, I, I, you know, I'm running this podcast. I'm a very technical person. I mean, in fact, I've actually, I've been trained in uh, in electromechanics, which is um, back in the day when I was going to school, this was to do with trams and, and, um, and trains. But now it's, it, it, that includes EVs. So, you know, I know a thing or two about electricity and stuff. But speaking of mens- mansplaining, I would sit at a charger and wait for it uh, for the charger to to get to the point where uh, the charger would the car will draw less than say twenty five kilowatts from the charger. I knew at that point it doesn't make any sense to keep on charging. I'll move on. Mm. But sometimes that will be you know ninety two percent say on the on the uh, on the display. And a number of times a man would come to me and try to mansplain to me why I shouldn't be charging over uh, over eighty percent, and I'd be like, mate please like i know what i'm doing it's, it's, still it's charging really fast. reassuring to know that you get mansplained to though as well greg <laughs> i i do i'm, I'm sure I've been, I, I used to be annoying to somebody you know one way or the other and i'm just just if you're if you're uh, if you think you've never been annoyed to anybody and on yeah annoying to anybody as a man you probably were so just you know i'm just appealing <laughs> to, i'm trying to appeal to men here don't don't try to explain to people like just wait patiently. this is for all the men out there <laughs> yes. if you feel yeah. the need to mansplain don't <laughs> don't i'm just i'm just mansplaining that to you and all yeah <laughs> thanks for uh, that, Greg. No, but, but in all serious seriousness i think people are just basically like you say, you're quite right that the uh, people have range anxiety and and especially when they're new to the car they want to be like this the need to kind of fill it up to the brim um kind of sits deep inside their brain and their psyche and they just have to you know do that um and mm-hmm. you can't really explain that to people like they have to once they you know it's something that you kind of learn i think on your own is you sit there at the charger for an hour and a half and everyone tells you oh, it's just a quick splash and dash for half an hour why do i have to sit here for an hour like it, it makes a you know once you realize that the, there's a uh, time goes on and you have to move on um mm-hmm. Like nobody told me, for instance, like the, the, what I do now is I drive the car for two, three hours, then plug in for 15, 20 minutes and then move on. Because, you know, depending on it all depends on the car and the person, obviously. But for me, that makes the most sense. Like um, I'm trying to maximize this sort of middle bit of the uh, the car's range. But, I, you know, my car can do 250 mile on charge or ish. Mm-hmm. Um, other people's car can do 150, say they might have a different approach to it. Um uh, who knows? But the one thing for sure is that there's way more chargers nowadays than there used to be um, when I started Yeah, driving. so it's, I mean, it's it's less of a concern. But also, now we're getting to this point where we've got more EVs on the road. And definitely, yeah. I, I don't know if you've experienced this in the last year, Greg, but I've really 
seen a difference in the last 12 months you know I'm having to queue more often um for charges which is great uh because we know that they're being used and it was a whole chicken and egg kind of situation before wasn't it like yeah. have we got enough EVs to warrant the demand for the charges and now we definitely have a demand for charges um but yeah it's interesting how you break that that journey down so that you're actually charging for like 15 20 minutes every few hours and I think it is something that you can only get relaxed with after a, the first three months of driving an EV. You start to trust your car when it tells you that it's low on, on mileage and you start to learn the limits. Everybody has been in turtle mode at some point <laughs> and felt like their gut drop when you see the little turtle come up. Um, I wonder who you know, came it, up with a little turtle on the, on the dash. First, I love it. Every car seems to have it now. No. Apart from I'm like, oh, here we go. Here we go again. <laughs> it's it's our equivalent of going into the red, isn't it? And and even then, you're not in the most insane amount of trouble in terms of can you find a charger? Because yes, you can. You might have to to, to wait for it. Hopefully, it's not owned by an oil and gas company and it's working. Uh, you know, shout out, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and you can be on your merry way again. But yeah, I mean, we've. We've definitely come such a long way. And I think kudos to the businesses who have gotten us to the point that we're at now. But we still have such a long way left to go. We you do. know, yeah. uh, anyway. 2030 is, yeah. what, eight years now? It's not, it's not long. It's not, it's not far. And as far as I know from all the, all the people that I know who work for um, OEMs, they're no longer bothering, uh, you know, designing uh, uh, petrol diesel engines. It's they're all kind of fully set on EVs. Um, apart, maybe apart from like Toyotas and stuff like that, but I don't talk to these people, so I have no <laughs> idea. Um, but the people that I talk to, you know, I know that they're fully serious about EVs and and hydrogen is not the future. So um, <laughs> I thought you were going to say, oh, and then there's the hydrogen gang. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, I mean, hydrogen, but... hydrogen has its place in large distribution and haulage. Okay. We're not saying a little bit of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. but it's <laughs> very, very, but not for your everyday day car use. And I worked out today um, using the Kona, you know, that's a reliable 240 miles range in the current weather. Now in the winter, it's probably more like 180, but with the weather being like it has recently, I know it's 240. I know the car, I trust the car. So I, now that I'm not driving up and down the country every day, only have been needing to charge the car once a week, if that, to get the full range to cover my my average daily journey. Um, and if you only need to charge once a week, you know, that, that should relax the pressure to have a charger put on the side of your house. As convenient as it is um, and, and wonderful to be able to charge a car at home, because it's a lifestyle change, you know, plugging in your car like you're with your mobile, brilliant. But even if you can't, have a charger installed on on the side of your home if you live in a flat or, or a graded building or whatever there is still hope for you yet you probably only need to charge your car once a week and guess what you can do that when you do your food shop like there are there are so many answers to all the previous obstacles around having an ev you know that it's it's just a a non-argument now so yeah and i've i've actually stopped arguing with petrol heads as well because i'm like it's fine you you have your opinion. We've I hit mean, that curve. I, I don't I, care. I, I, was, I, was, like, I mean, anybody who I talk to who's a pe proper petrol head, they um, they're scared of even sitting in the electric car. They know, <laughs> like they they just know yeah. if they have a go, that's going to be it. So they there's they're, no, they're literally there's just no they're resisting back. even like they're like, and I'm uh, all like, you know like you say all all I, all I can say to them is like nobody's taking your cars away, mate. Like. <laughs> It's... If anything, electric cars. So my my previous argument, I, I don't try. I try not to waste my energy with this anymore. <laughs> but um, with the great thing about EVs is, if you drive an EV to do all your lovely day to day stuff, like doing the food shopping, getting the kids from school, like going to work, all of that stuff, then you get to save your beautiful car that you love <laughs> so much for your weekend drives, for long distance journeys. You know. Um, you're not using it so much. So you're actually going to preserve the lifelong um, 
integrity of, of that vehicle. And if it's a classic, there are so many wonderful companies out there that will convert it <laughs> to an electric car. Like there's there's so many yeah. solutions now, which is which is lovely. But you know, good chats to have. <laughs> <laughs> Kate, um, we need a call to action. Like, what, how can people help you, and what can they do? Okay. If anyone's good idea. still watching this, you know, after an hour of our, of our... <laughs> we've I mean, gone I'm... off on a tangent. So with safety and accessibility, a great call to action at the moment, I am fundraising. I am actively fundraising to ensure that the business can get off to the very best start. At the moment, um, I have up until a few weeks ago been working two jobs, one full-time job, and then everything charged safe from five until two o'clock in the morning. And it was exhausting. My partner is still in full-time employment and I never get to see him because he's just working all the time. So what we're doing now is we're fundraising so that we can both be out on the road and start inspecting the units to collect the data, to see how it's going to work, to notify the networks of where their pitfalls are and, and areas for improvements are, to share that data with all the mapping applications. Um, so if anybody is aware of anybody looking for an investment opportunity, please let me know. Um, that would be fantastic. But also we will be launching our user interface very soon. So We've got our official inspector inspections, which is a 50 point inspection program. But we've also got a much more simplified user uh, based platform, which will help us fill in the gaps in between the official inspections. So uh, an official inspection will happen at every unit once per quarter. That is our commitment. In the meantime, if any issues come up uh, where something is faulty or, you know, if something's vandalized or if a light goes out, um, we want to know about it in real time. So we're asking for people to let us know if they're interested in testing. Um, it will be a case of the system's a bit slow. Um, maybe the questions are a little bit too in-depth. You know, we want to know, could you be bothered to sit? and complete 10 questions at a charge point is 10 questions too much are the questions relevant we're really relying on public feedback so again if you're interested in the volunteer opportunity until we can afford to start employing people then get in touch again um, and the best place to get in touch with me is the hello at chargesafe.uk email um, or find me on twitter yeah twitter's the best place <laughs> For everybody to like would you would you accept from people just like if somebody's at the charger and there's something going on or everything's all right do you mm. think like people just sending you pictures of the charger uh, yeah it's fine absolutely i mean it, it wouldn't form a part of the official inspection but um because that that has to be verified um in order for us to to ensure you know yeah, that it's yeah. you know definitely safe but if you are visiting a particularly lovely charge point feel free to give it a shout out let us know tag us in it and if there's something that just feels really wrong about a charge point as well uh tag us let us know and if you'd prefer a more discreet method then feel free to send me a direct message and let me know you know it, it's very important that we are neutral and mindful that all of the charge point network operators you know are that they should all be seen as brandless in an inspector's eyes so we should be delivering a completely unbiased independent service so we will not be taking any sponsorship or advertising money from any of these businesses in exchange for favorable reviews that's absolutely not going to be the case here but likewise you know from speaking to people like ian um there are issues there that I wouldn't have been aware of previously where it's not necessarily in their control to do things like having sufficient lighting at legacy sites that have gone in five years ago, because that would be more down to the landlord. So I don't want to penalise them too much for things that are beyond their control, but I definitely want to support the networks and being able to implement those improvements wherever possible. And I will be calling out the ones who refuse to, 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 to work with them. Yeah. <laughs> because they should care about people's safety. You know, yeah, it, we've just had International Women's Day. We've seen some really horrific statistics. It's not okay. We should all feel safe being able to charge our car um, as much as we do filling up the car. And and that's all I've got to say about that, Greg. <laughs> no, that's fair enough. Uh, you know, I think that should give people plenty to think about. And thank you for uh, 
for appearing on Take It Easy. Unless you want to be talking about anything else. Um, no, no, honestly, we'll I'm just so now, grateful so. <laughs> to, to be on Take It Easy. I, I, I feel like uh, I've really made it now, you know. <laughs> All I can say is uh, thank you for, uh, for starting this campaign because I think it's very important that people should feel safe. And, you know, whatever the outcome of it is, whether it's improved regulation, uh, charging point operators actually doing something about it, or, or them, them having just leverage against the uh, the landlords to say, look, you know, nobody's going to be coming here if your uh, your safety record or your safety, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, uh, feel or, you know, is going to be low. Like if you, if we can't tell people that it's safe, um, that, 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 that is a great leverage leverage and if all charging point operators operate against the same standard that obviously makes makes it an even um yeah. playing field which it, it should be like uh, it shouldn't be that one charging operator wins against the other one because they're uh they're uh, a, you know they're, they're just willing to forego safety like that's just ridiculous um, yeah. and the number of times that I, yeah I, the number of times that i felt unsafe again you know it's not just women um the number of times that i felt unsafe because i've been driving somewhere on friday evening and on saturday evening and people have been partying in the town and you know mm. you, you just I mean, you, or you have to leave your car for half an hour to go get some something to eat and you, you yeah know, and you really don't want to leave the car yeah. in an and area you're in like spot that. somewhere and you have no idea what's going on um you know mm. yeah it it's it it makes it better for everybody so i think i think it's a very very good uh initiative and you know i wish it succeeds because the uh it has to like something has to change things have to improve (laughs) absolutely thank you very much for your support greg i really appreciate it no reason Uh, thank you for uh for taking the time to kate (laughs) all right (laughs) i don't know how to end this like properly (laughs) (laughs) do you not have like a cool catchphrase that you can use well you do you you like you have a cool catchphrase like take it easy take it easy for now yeah I mean, you're you're the marketing guru. I, I, you know, maybe I need to, with all the all the nine quid that I get every month from patrons, I need to employ you. <laughs> yeah. I'll see if I can come up with a cool, quirky catchphrase. Or actually, you know, maybe we could do that thing where if you've gotten this far on the podcast and you've got any cool ideas for how Greg should be signing off on Take It Easy, that just makes the whole ending flow that much nicer. Then let him know, tag him. <laughs> Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this uh, conversation that we had. Uh, visit all the things that Kate has mentioned uh, during the uh, the podcast. You know, uh, if you have any questions for her, hello at uh, chargesafe.uk. Uh, the website is www.chargesafe.uk. And uh, it's at uh, evchargesafe on Twitter. And of course, follow me on Twitter at takeitev. And as always, hug each other more and high five and, you know, these and all that stuff. See you later. Um, um, um. Who is Yo? And why? <laughs>